On Larry King Now, we close out showrunner week with the creator of The Vampire Diaries, Julie Pleck. Death has to be in the mix because if you, if you don't have death at the at the head of the game, that threat. then, then so you're not, there's no stakes. How far ahead <laughs> do you know you're going? At the beginning of the year, you think you know everything. By the end of the year, you know nothing. And uh, you pretend you're not making some of it up as you go along, and sometimes you, you're a liar. Plus, the brains behind The Walking Dead executive producer, Scott M. Gimple. Uh, there's so much noise we have in our lives, and to feel something deeply, even fear, uh, is a treat. Plus, are you very hands-on? I'm pretty hands-on. I almost said handsy, but that's different. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Our special guest, Julie Pleck, executive producer, co-creator of the hit TV series, The Vampire Diaries, Diaries Rally, currently in its fifth season on The CW. That's Thursdays at 8 p.m. Also executive producer of two freshman series on The CW, The Originals. That airs on Tuesdays at 8. And The Tomorrow People, which recently relocated to Monday nights at 9. How do you know where you are? I've lost track completely. If it's Tuesday, this must be Belgium. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you juggle three shows? Um, well, I have a really, really solid team in place. Um, you know, Vampire Diaries is in its fifth year, so uh, over the five years we've been able to work a group of people up to the point where they actually can do a lot of it on their own, and some of it better than I ever could. So that helps. <laughs> how did you, what nice. did you want to be when you were a kid? Um, you know, in, in no particular order, I wanted to be a professional tennis player, um, even though I was wildly mediocre at playing tennis. And then when I came to terms with that, I wanted to be um, a news anchor woman, believe it or not. Um, and then I think there was a flight attendant fantasy in there somewhere. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from outside of Chicago, the suburbs of Chicago. Now, how did you get to meet Wes Craven? How did you get into the television field? Well, I... Moved out of here, I moved out to Los Angeles uh, after graduation. I went to Northwestern and uh, left Chicago in September, about tw exactly 20 years ago, this September, and had no idea how to get a job. Just knew I wanted to work in the entertainment business and, and make movies or tell stories. And so I just started looking through the want ads in The Hollywood Reporter and hoping for the best and, and, and got a job uh, as an agent's assistant uh, three weeks of the day after I moved to town and everything kind of just took How off. did you hook up with Wes Craven? Wes, beautifully enough, uh, his assistant at the time was a woman who is now, interestingly, my agent, but at the time was his assistant. <laughs> and she went to college with my cousin, also Northwestern. So a whole mafia thing going there. And I was helping her sell tickets to an improv show that she was producing. And she said, oh, you sell tickets really well. Um, do you want to be an assistant to a director? And I said, well, I don't want to direct. And I don't know if I even like horror movies very much. But yes, I do. And so she brought me in. And I met Wes and his partner, Marianne. And uh, it began from there. And that's where I understand you met Vampire Diaries co-creator uh, Kevin Williamson, right? Yes, Kevin wrote uh, Scream, which right. was originally titled Scary Movie, and he uh, came into the office after after we decided to do it, after Wes decided to direct it, and he and I became instantly friends. It was his first script that was getting made. It was my first movie and that I'd ever worked on. And How did Vampire Diaries come about? Uh, Kevin and I, gosh, seven years, six years ago, I guess now, we're having lunch with a friend of ours, uh, a woman named Jen Breslow, who was an executive at the CW, who used to be Kevin's assistant back when I worked with Kevin. And uh, and she, we were just talking about Twilight and about vampires and, and the genre itself. And she said, hey, we've got these books. Do you guys want to do them? And we said yes. And then she went and made the deal, and it was done. And over Took lunch. Took off right away? Over lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Funny business. Yeah, it's great. Now, the Tomorrow People is a follow-up to The Vampire. What is it? Well, The Tomorrow People is actually a remake of a BBC series from the 70s. Um, and, uh, and it's something that I watched as a kid on Nickelodeon back in the day. Is it a vampire uh, show? Too? No, it's about uh, young adults who have supernatural abilities. They have, they're the next wave of human evolution, and they can teleport and use telekinesis. Is it hard to follow a series that was already a series? It is and it isn't. You've got a built-in fan base that, um, you know, is willing to come check out and make sure you didn't screw up their, you know, their beloved show. Um, and then there's also that sense of, you know, how much freedom do you have to make no, changes. Nothing about your background, Julie, Northwest and everything, would say this is a woman interested in the supernatural. It's true. So 
How come? Well, you know, I I genuinely didn't believe I was interested in the supernatural until I really thought about my upbringing. At, and I was a big reader. Um, pretty much from the time I was in first grade all the way through high school, I was always the one that was had the Stephen King book. Um, you know, tucked. I was. My friends were hanging out, and I was tucked in the bed in the so corner. So you always had that. Yeah. So I interest I'd, in the macabre. Interest in the interest in in yes, in the macabre and in the in the in the sort of true to life frightening. Even though the circumstances are extreme and extraordinary, the the context for it is very human. The very human story of a woman whose dog goes rabid and she's trapped in the car like Cujo. You know, um, that was really just about a woman trying to protect. It all her kid. comes down to what's on the page, right? Yeah. yeah it can't be that. Are you in a man's world? Um, well, I think that the beauty, especially for television, is that you say executive producer now, and the first couple names that come out off your head are women, and so that's Who are the showrunners you look up to? Uh, well, I love Shonda Rhimes. I'm a huge fan of Scandal, and I was a huge fan of Grey's Anatomy, and she's just a, a force. Do you like the term showrunner? I do, because that's exactly what it is that we're doing. You run the show. We are the captains of the ship, and... Keeping the train on the tracks. Do you have a favorite character? <laughs> um, I do. I, <laughs> I love all my children equally, but I do particularly love the character of Caroline, um, who's sort of a girl that uh, found her way by becoming a vampire. Now, there used to be a dilemma. It's, what does an executive producer do? The answer to that is everything. Um, everything and anything. and. Learning the power to delegate, I think, is, is the number one on the top of that The list. male girl has a problem comes to you? Yep. <laughs> well, <laughs> usually I can find somebody that can handle the male girl. But, but everything else, costume fittings, music, uh, editing, you know, being on set when you can, rewriting, writing, breaking the story, all of it. It definitely, it's equal parts storytelling, management, and producing. Um, not all three of which everybody's good at. You know. The toughest people to find are? Uh, really good writers. <laughs> it comes down to that, right? It comes down to that. It comes down to a voice and a point of view and the ability to sparkle on the page. And um, some people are great at action but can't write dialogue. Some people write the best dialogue but can't tell a good story. And it, finding somebody that can really hit everything is a really rare uh, and a really beautiful thing. With three shows going, do you hop around all through? Uh, how do you work your day? I work my day with whatever needs my attention the most. The Tomorrow People shoots in Vancouver, and it has a tremendous team in place that does most of the day-to-day, -day, if not all the day-to-day -day work. And so I'm there as kind of a helper. Call me if you get in trouble. Call me if you need something kind of presence. The other two, we share an office, we share a kitchen, and I just go bounce from room to room and say, okay, what are we doing? What's happening today? We try to get some spoilers out of Julie when we get back. We'll try. We're back with one of the best showrunners in the business, Julie Pleck. All right, what can we expect? Give us a scoop on some shows. What's going to happen on The Vampire Diaries? Anything. A clue. People die. People are dying. No. <laughs> They always die, but a lot of them this year are, are in, in danger and at risk, more than yeah. ever. So actors on this cannot expect a lifelong part. They, they have to be really, really nice. What's going to happen on the originals? <laughs> the originals, the entire fate of the French Quarter and the supernatural regime uh, that exists within it is all up in arms because everybody that wants a piece of it is coming at it hard and betraying everyone else left, right, and center. And so there's a big battle for New Orleans coming. And the Tomorrow People. Well, the Tomorrow People is all about who's who's on the right side of the, of of of, of the, the good people. Who's a liar? Who's a manipulator? And ultimately, you know, getting us to the point: are, are these people going to survive as one, or are they going to be at war with each other? How far and ahead do you know you're going? <laughs> at the beginning of the year, you think you know everything. By the end of the year, you know nothing, and uh, you pretend you're not making some of it up as you go along. And sometimes you, you're a liar. When you get up in the morning, where do you go first? Uh, when I get up in the morning, I go to Vampire Originals office and I uh, have a dose of caffeine and I hit the ground running. Are you emotionally attached to one story over another? You know, I'm emotionally attached to the emotional stories, and so whichever show is telling a stronger emotional through line at the moment is the one that I, you know, I get giggly and. You're always like looking that. for something new. Um, always Would thinking you about want it. To executive produce a fourth show. Yes. <laughs> You do. I have this weird dream of being a fixer. I'd like to be a fixer. I'd like to be the person that people call in and say, we are dying. The ship is sinking. Please come do they and have save those, us. They have those on Broadway. Yeah, they have them in TV, too. They do? They oh, absolutely. Fixed. Have fans' reactions ever forced you to change your story? 
Uh, they can impact how you feel about a story, and then you have to work very hard to not change course just because of a fan response, because you don't know you don't know the legitimacy of the volume of feedback that you're getting. You don't know if it's one person tweeting at you from 800 names, or if or if truly people are that upset. Are you the final say, or is the network? I'm the final say in the sense that I'm very respectful of the networks and the studio's wishes, and they're very respectful, and they trust me. So it's actually a really good relationship, because they'll say, what do you think about this? And I'll say, well, here's why we're doing it this way. And they say, great, fine. There's no one at the network can blue pencil you? No, no, no. I mean, it, they, they will respectfully say, hey, we're not crazy about this moment, or do you mind changing this line? And we do, usually, but it's never been a mandate. And how do you know when you want to, like, you spin off the originals? How do you know when you want to do a spin off? Uh, risky, isn't it? It's yeah. Oh, a spinoff is always the riskiest thing you can do because you d you risk diluting the impact of the mothership, um, mm. you know, the Vampire Diaries, which you never want to do anything to hurt that. And you also risk the audience not being as engaged. Uh, in this case of the originals, we had three characters that had been on the Vampire Diaries as a family for two and a half years, so, and we knew how good they were and how powerful they were and how much the audience liked them. So we felt pretty confident. Now I'm told that fans of the originals got a big shock when Rebecca, played by Claire Holt, left. Yes. Why did you do that? Yes, well, <laughs> according to somebody on the internet, I personally fired her, which is, of course, not true. She had a limited contract when she agreed to do the series. She had already played the role for several years and didn't want to sign on for a whole six-year contract, which is what everybody else has to do. And so we all agreed that we would give her the best, best run that we possibly could until she was done. You're a thin line here in a vampire series. You don't want to kill off someone, right? Popular. Right. But, but. <laughs> one of the keys to the success is to kill off popular people. So are you uh, always going through a dichotomy? Yes, absolutely. It's You can fall in love with an actor and fall out of love with their character very easily. And r the reverse. The worst is when you fall out of love with the actor, but the character is still valuable, because then, then there's not much you can do there. But um, death has to be in the mix because it has to be a life or death stakes show. And to be able to kill people, even people that the fans like and get angry with you about, um, if you if you don't have death at the, at the head of the game, threat. then, then so you're not, there's no stakes. Indiana Jones were a weekly series and you kill off Harrison Ford, would be a little <laughs> weird, but those are decisions you have to make, right? Yeah, and the best thing you can do is not name the show after your, any of your characters. Yeah, right. <laughs> we said on day one of The Vampire Diaries, just so you know, it's called The Vampire Diaries, not Elena's show, you know? So there's always that threat. Do you get very close with the actors? I do. I, you know, I got a great piece of advice from a big time showrunner a few years back. He said, let me tell you one thing that you should never do. Never become friends with your cast because it's so awful watching them turn into monsters. And it, 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 it's so heartbreaking when it happens. And I said, good advice. And I tried very hard to not, but it's inevitable. Ten years from now, what are you, a fixer? <laughs> I'm either a fixer, I'm a host on The View, or I'm <laughs> writing young adult novels in Hawaii. Or spinning around somewhere. Or just dead. <laughs> thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. I want to thank our guest, Julie Pleck. Make sure you watch The Vampire Diaries, The Originals, and The Tomorrow People, and whatever else she comes up with, all on The CW. <laughs> and check out my blog at kingsthings.ora.tv to hear Julie's answers to your social media questions. Up next, I'm joined by the executive producer of The Walking Dead, Scott M. Gimple. Stay tuned. Welcome to Larry King Now. Our special guest is Scott M. Gimple. He started his career with Matt Groening's Bungo Comics. He wrote and edited Simpsons comics before writing for TV shows such as Drive, Life, and Flash Forward. He joined AMC's The Walking Dead in 2011. He's currently the executive producer and showrunner the smash hits fourth season finale had a record 15.7 million viewers. Explain that. Why is The Walking Dead <laughs> attracting 15 million people? Uh, I would say there's nothing like it on television. Um, I would say it's a character-driven show. And in that show, uh, I think one of the main questions that people ask when they watch it is, what would I do? What would I do in this situation? There are, are moral choices. There are uh, a lot of strange practical choices you have to make. And ultimately, I think it is about maintaining your humanity in an inhumane world and how difficult that is. And I think that's ultimately an extremely hopeful thing. Think it's revolutionary? 
evolutionary or rep? It's evolutionary. I think it's evolutionary. It's the evolutionary. It's the evolution of both zombie movies and television. And I think it's revolutionary in that Robert Kirkman thought of an idea that I think can be simply said, what about a zombie movie that never ended? Why are we fascinated with all of it? I think as far as, as, far as zombies go... Or horror or ghouls. Why are we fascinated with that? Oh, I think that comes down to just feeling something. I think uh, we're busy people and we have... Death. Death and death. all that, but I think there's also just make me feel something. You know, uh, there's so much noise we have in our lives, and to feel something deeply, even fear, uh, is a treat. Now, you started as co-producer and writer, and now you're showrunner. Showrunner's kind of a new name in show business, isn't it? I'd say the last 10 years. I mean, it was always there, but in the last 10 years. You know, the audience has become so savvy that showrunner is something that everybody knows now. Yeah. And they know the people who did it, do it, and it's, it's an incredible thing. But How it's come you're the time. third in four years? Um, why do they show? Why are they changing showrunners? <laughs> I think it's a, it's a difficult show. Uh, I think it was based on just places where uh, my former bosses were, um, and uh, you know, I, I, they've all they've both moved on to really cool things. Is there something uh, specific that Darbot Mazaraza left their fingerprints on? You worked under both of them, right? Is yeah, your I style did. Style different. Well, I, you know, it's funny. I think my style is kind of a, an amalgamation of like the greatest hits that we've done. Um, there's things that Frank did that are just indelible in the show. Uh, there's influences that Glenn had that absolutely remain to this day. And uh, I, tried to, I tried to take the best of both of them. I worked under both of them and uh, just keep it going. A lot of pressure because the show is so popular? You know, it's funny. I think any show, there's a great deal of pressure. If you want to do a great job, and especially if you have an amazing crew and an amazing cast, amazing producers, and then these unbelievable fans, you just don't want to let them down with something that is subpar. Are you very hands-on? I'm pretty hands-on. I almost said handsy, but that's <laughs> different. What's a day in your life like? Like, do you get up and where do you go? I'd say one of the best things about being a showrunner uh, for someone like me who has ADD is that it's different every day. Sometimes I'm in LA where we write and edit. Sometimes I'm in Atlanta where we shoot. Um, the, it's actually the time of year. That's what changes. The first third of the year or of our season, we're like writing. Now. Yeah, and we're just, we're just in the writing phase right now in the pre-production. And next month, production starts and then you layer something on top of the writing because you're still doing it. Then post-production starts. And on this show, you have editorial, but also unbelievable special effects that take a great deal of work. You layer that on top. And there's this period right in the middle where you're doing writing, you're doing production, you're doing post-production. That's the most intense time. And then each part sort of falls away near the end. And you're on top of all of it, right? I am. I am. I try to be. Who do you answer to? The fans, firstly, uh, and then the network. AMC. Yeah. You did something interesting, I understand, with the second half of the season. Your main character, Rick Grimes, wasn't featured a lot. Why? Yeah. Well, it isn't. Deliberate, a, right? It, well, it, was, it, it wasn't It was deliberate in as much as like, oh, let's see Rick less. It was both driven by the plot, by the circumstance they had, but also an opportunity to play out all of the members of this ensemble's individual stories and to deepen our relation to them even more. Um, I didn't like having to go away from Rick so much, but also the circumstances of the story that we were telling sort of demanded it. And I still think we were able to tell a very satisfying story for Rick, but also for the rest of the characters. Now, season five is this fall. You're in yes. the process of that now, right? Yeah, we're just, uh, well, we're well away in the writing, and then we'll start shooting next month. Can you tell us anything? Just something, Scott. Come on, we're being so nice to you. <laughs> give us some tip in the upcoming season, like Captain Midnight in the old days on radio would give us a clue okay. for the next day's mm. entrant. Well, I would say this. The show, every eight episodes, reinvents itself. Like this last half season, we focused on all these different characters. Before that, there was a different structure where we had... 
um, a couple of different big stories crash together. So what, what couple of words will you give us about season five? Just action, action intensity. Um, there'll still be the character stuff there, but the balance is going to be a little different. And uh, More action than usual? The story that we're telling demands it. Um, we're not going to shy away from character, but the balance will be a little more towards action. Any laughs? Yes, absolutely. We are represent. I want to represent the whole of human experience. I don't want to show just horror and misery because if you just do that, it doesn't mean anything. You need the light. You need humanity. You need love. You need friendship because those are the things that you're trying to maintain amidst these horror. And when you win, that makes the victories that much more sweet. But when you lose, that makes things that much more dark. Scott Start in Comics is next. Don't go away. Thing that keeps you up at night. Uh, the Walking Dead. I watch it late at night, and then everything to me is a zombie. Are you, every shadow are you hung every, on that show? Love it. Love it. Why? I'm an addict. Because the title the is not about the zombies. The title is about the, the humans, and I find it fascinating. It's an exploration of at what point is life not worth it anymore? At what point do you become worse than the thing you're hunting? It's a fascinating show. Great acting, great writing. We're with Scott M. Gimple. He is the showrunner for the incredible hit... The Walking Dead entering its fifth season. 15.7 million viewers. Whoa. You start in comic books as? As, uh, you know, I started as an intern. Even in college, actually, I interned for Marvel Comics. And then I desperately wanted to get into comics. And uh, one of the main companies out here was Matt Groening's Bongo Comics, all the Simpsons comics. And uh, it, I interned there while I was working a job to support myself and I eventually became an assistant editor. But I moved into animation, actually, after, after uh, Bongo Comics. I started working for Disney, and I eventually made my own cartoon there, and that was my first showrunning experience, was a cartoon I made for Disney. Back to The Walking Dead, you have a high death toll. Yes. Who makes, uh, do you make the decision on who dies? I do, and it's, uh, it's not easy, but it's all about serving the story. Ever regret killing a beloved person? I think I always regret killing a beloved person. Ever regret killing a hated person? Um, not if it serves the story. Not a, and, and to tell you the truth, I'll say this. I, I want most characters that die on this show, most of them, not all of them, because there are villains, I want the audience to love them. I want them to, f to feel when they die. And even when the governor died, who was a character who was a villain, he flirted with humanity. He almost made it. And he died when he decided to turn away from humanity. It must be tough for actors. You can't sign an actor on for three years guaranteed on this show, can you? It's sort of a year-to-year -year thing. Because the, they don't know when they're going to go. Because no. we interviewed a character once who got killed the next week. <laughs> I will say Lauren Cohan, who plays Maggie, I think has the best sort of perspective on it. She believes that this show helps her live in the moment and enjoy every moment because it is a very enjoyable set. It's an incredible crew. It's a very tight-knit cast. That's one of the hardest things about dying on this show. is isn't necessarily a job. All these people have found great work after leaving the show, but the show is a very special thing. You're going to knock her off? <laughs> okay. Has AMC ever said no to a script? No, not that I know of. Um, we, you know, they're a network, they have notes, but it's never been no to a script. Uh, any thoughts of a spinoff? There is a spinoff in the works. Uh, I'm not involved because this is a very, very demanding show. But Robert Kirkman, who created the comic, is co-creating, or no, I think he believe, he's creating that show with a very talented writer, Dave Erickson. Do you know what they're going to call it? I'm... You know, I don't, but I, I'm smart enough to know that The Walking Dead will be in the title. Do you know how the show's going to end? You know, it's funny. The comic book continues to this day. The comic book that the uh, show is based upon. The uh, issue 124 or 5 comes out. I'm sort of ahead because I get them early. And uh, Robert has said he, he's going to go at least 300 issues. So... It's kind of a strange thing. I read the comic every, every month or bi-monthly. It occasionally comes out as a fan. You so, do? Yeah. I tell him not to spoil things for me. He has in the past. I've really gotten angry at him. So 
I read the comic as a fan, and in the week I think, okay, how does this lead to the greatest, greater story? I will say, from an emotional standpoint, I do have an ending in mind, but I want it to suss with the work that Robert's doing. As a comic fan, what do you think of Family Guy? Uh, well, I think the bigger question is, as a Simpsons fan, what do I think of Family Guy? Because that's like, it's, you know, that's like uh, Ohio State and Michigan. Right. Um, uh, but Family Guy takes more risks than The Simpsons. Oh, do, well, I, uh, let's not get in an argument here, Larry. You don't, uh, you don't deny that. I would say that Family Guy, the thing that's revolutionary about, revolutionary about Family Guy is Seth's timing. He's a genius. The, what he does with his voice and the timing that he does is unbelievable. I'll tell you this. I started an animation with Mr. Seth MacFarlane. He was my story editor on Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, the animated series. And he would call me, pretending to be the producers of the show, doing the voice of the producers of the show, making very absurd requests, of which I would follow. But oh, Family yeah. Guy takes more risks than The Simpsons I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not going to agree with that. Well, I, why I, would my wife say it's okay for the kids to watch The Simpsons and not Family Guy? Oh, well, I'll say this. Oh, man. <laughs> you, you put me on the spot. No, like, you I'm just talking. These are the two here. most famous... I, I They're the two best animated shows on television. Yeah, I would say this. Uh, there is something about The Simpsons that is based in heart and humanity and family. And I would say... <laughs> family Guy not. I would say Family Guy is more of a hard satire of American life. And it's a little more acerbic. And there is sweetness in Family Guy. I don't want to say that. But... I, I would say this, The Simpsons is sweeter. You'll give me Absol that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, man. Oh, no, thank you. This was amazing. We're going to thank do more. You. I want to thank my guest, the showrunner, Scott M. Gimple. And if you aren't watching The Walking Dead on AMC, you're one of a very few people. Look for more thrills in season five, and you can go to my blog at kingsthings.aura.tv to hear Scott's answers to your social media questions. Remember, you can find me at King's Things, and I'll see you next time.